speaker unfortunately couldn't be here with us, so we arranged her talk over video. It's gonna last roughly 20 minutes and there will be time for Q&A. So uh, Bast is gonna be here on stage uh, translating your questions uh, to uh, Brittany uh, over the interwebs. So <laughs> Brittany works as lead web developer uh, for the Pittsburgh Cultural Trust nonprofit. She's the host of the 5x5 Ruby on Rails podcast and her alter ego, Norma Skates, plays and referees roller derby. She couldn't be with us in person, so um, here she is. Yeah, you can give the applause because it's going to be live. So uh, Not now, at, at the uh, at the Q and A, yeah. Uh, her talk today is going to be Rails against the machine, and she will tell us how we can use Rails and AWS to identify bad actors and protect our online business. And now the video. <laughs> Enjoy. Hello, we're beyond the ice virtually. My name is Brittany Martin, and thank you for tuning in as I kick off my talk, Rails Against the Machine. First off, I want to thank the organizers for making it possible for me to participate in this conference, even though I had a scheduling conflict. This conference looks absolutely amazing, wonderful speakers, snow-related activities, and I imagine a really good group of attendees, and I'm super jealous, and I hope you're having an absolute wonderful time. Even better, the organizers have worked with me to host a live Q&A after this talk. Throughout the talk, you're gonna see my Twitter handle at the bottom footer, it's Britt J. Martin. If you have any questions or comments about the talk, please tweet at me because I am eagerly reading those tweets back in the States. So who am I? I'm the lead web developer for the Pittsburgh Cultural Trust. I work for a large nonprofit that has worked to make the Steel City, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in the States, a place where the arts can flourish. Our, arts, our efforts have focused on the cultural and economic development of the Cultural District, a 14 square block area of downtown Pittsburgh. I work on a Ruby on Rails e-commerce site that is the ticketing site for 10 different arts organizations, including our very own ballet, opera, and symphony. The ideas around this talk are a culmination of all the experience that I have had. And I've had a wide range of experience from working to a, with a hosting provider to supporting a call center. Now you may have heard this mentioned at the very top of the talk, but at night I play roller derby. I am Norma Skates, a play on Psycho's famous mother, Norma Bates. I play for the Little Steel Derby Girls in Youngstown, Ohio and the Pittsburgh East Roller Villains in Greensburg, Pennsylvania. I started playing about two years ago, and I didn't know that Derby would become one of the most significant, awesome things I have ever done with my life. Between programming and Derby, they have become the pillars of my self-confidence. If you have ever had an interest in roller derby, I highly recommend reaching out to your local league to see how you can get involved. It's really a wonderful sport that teaches you about athleticism and teamwork. Lastly, I'm the host of the 5x5 Ruby on Rails podcast, which you can subscribe to in a variety of different ways, including iTunes. It is a serious thrill ride to get to chat one-on-one -on -one with some of my Ruby heroes, including several that are speaking at this very conference. Please talk to me about it, and remember, please tweet to me. I'm always looking for feedback and guests. But enough about me. Let's move on to why I'm appearing before you today. In an ideal world, our customers visit our websites and apps and happily purchase the products that we so lovingly make for them in an ideal world. But in reality, that is not always the case. There are villains out there and they are visiting your website. Who are these villains? These are the kind of people that are accessing your website to game it, to milk the system, to bend the rules. Essentially, these villains are using the rules and procedures to manipulate the system for a desired outcome. Throughout this talk, I'll be referring to these users as bad users because whether you want them or not, they are using your site. These are the users who will cheat, harass, and attempt to manipulate you and your business into giving them exactly what they want. For the purpose of this talk, I'm focusing on bad users on your site who disguise themselves as regular customers, and that is a very specific point here. I am not looking to talk about bots and hackers that are looking to attack you via security vulnerabilities that might be technically available on your website. I'm looking to talk about the behavioral bad users. I do want to point out that these people who steal pathologically are generally not doing it to intentionally harm anyone. 
The stealing meets a need, whether it's emotionally or literally. This does not mean we shouldn't learn to protect our property, though, but it's good to keep that in mind. So as an example, embrace yourself. I'm about to throw a American football reference here, but if you knew the that could be dangerous. We're not focusing on a streaker that is wandering onto the playing field with no intention on playing the game. What we're looking to focus in this talk is learning the tactics to deal with players that have been rostered onto the team, but are committing penalties in order to gain an advantage. The first step in protecting yourself is identifying which users on your site are trying to break the rules. And luckily for us, we have a variety of avenues in order to achieve that. Ask questions. Review your user personas with your de design team. They spend a lot of time stepping into the different user roles that could possibly happen on your website. And they are, good, they are a great resource to be able to talk about those bad users. Definitely consult with your customer support team and try to identify negative patterns. Typically, in most organizations, your customer support and sales team are the users in your company that have the most one-on-one uh, -on -one interaction with your customers. And then lastly, review your application logs to find patterns of malicious users. So not necessarily users that are trying to hack your system, but maybe users that are trying to combine coupons in order to, you know, end up with an insanely good deal. So what do these bad users look like? What I'd like to do is prevent, present a couple examples of bad users out in the wild and use that so that you can identify what you might come across. So the main bad user that I work with, with day to day is ticket resellers. They buy tickets in large quantities in order to resell their tickets for profit. Many ticket resellers use URLs that are similar to official box office websites, and they will actually spend a ton of money with Google AdWords in order to promote their website above a legitimate website. They imply via their text and pictures that they are the official website. And they definitely don't clearly state that the real prices of a ticket are what they paid for versus what they're charging you. Even more obnoxious is that they have private forums where they actually collude together. Another example are serial returners, and this is someone that you might interact with in e-commerce or on site. They, for example, they might switch the UPC code on a $600 faucet with a lower cost code that rings up at $50. They then buy the faucet, replace the fake UPC tag with the original higher price code, and return the faucet to the store without the receipt for a $600 store credit, which can be later sold online. And lastly, I wanted to address upvote rings. And the idea of an upvote ring is it's the practice of forming rings to upvote items on community platforms like Hacker News. These are not necessarily bots, but basically they're trying to dodge having to pay for advertising to promote their content. So what are the results of these bad users? When bad users come in between you and your ideal customers, it can lead to profit loss, lost relationships, and inflation on the prices that you need to charge. So it is up to you and your company to determine what type of strategy you are going to adopt. And you really do have two choices here. You can either blatantly kick the bad customers off your site by alerting them that you know what they are doing, or you can choose to quietly degrade the experience of those known bad users. In my career, and I think we can all say this as well, we've seen both of these options pay, uh, play out. I find option two, quietly degrading, to be much more effective. In this day and age, word spreads quickly between our bad users. If you put up a hard and fast wall, they will work even harder to get around it. I'm gonna show you the tools you have at your disposal to execute idea number two well. When it comes to identifying and executing a strategy against bad users, I recommend trying to automate it as much as possible. The key here is it reduces the amount of resources needed and it keeps the determination of bad users fair, which can be very tricky in a lot of different organizations. Luckily for us as developers, and thus why we are at this conference, we have a plethora of tools at the ready for us to use. And no surprise here, as I mentioned prior, and as you've gathered from the title of this talk, I am a loud and proud Ruby on Rails developer. The framework makes it really easy to model a bad user and refer to it throughout your application's customer's journey. Once you have identified the subset of users that you want to target, create a model that de defines how a user will get categorized. 
In our case, our model is called reseller. Since we have such a localized business of selling tickets to the Pittsburgh region, we have determined that users purchasing tickets in the tri-state area are deemed safe. You can see the constant safe states defined with a string literal up top. When deciding whether or not a user can print their tickets home, a very loved feature for resellers so they don't have to visit our box office or wait for the mail, we do a tri-state check on the billing address. We use a shared CRM between the box office call center and our website, and this is incredibly important that we have a shared resource between the three different avenues in which we sell tickets. So you want to evaluate within your own company to make sure that when you, I, when you work with a customer that there is one place that that record is stored so that you're able to mark them. When a user's interactions fit a reseller, we mark them in our CRM, and this becomes the point of truth for making decisions going forward. In our reseller model, we have a constant that maps to the ID we keep in our CRM to indicate a reseller. As a user moves through the purchasing process, we do a check based on their session to see if they are a reseller. We sneak the checks in as they're doing common actions on our website. So for example, for us is logging in, creating an account, and possibly making a purchase. All of these checks and marking them do not come for free because we need to call out to our CRM's API. A background or asynchronous job or task is one that is processed outside of the usual request response workflow that is part of any modern web framework. For us, Sidekick, a popular background processing library in the Ruby community that we probably all very much use and love, has proven to be incredibly useful to offloading these API calls. When we discovered a new ticket reseller logging into our site, we push a new catch new reseller worker into queue. Remember, since we chose option two, we are allowing them to continue to purchase so this task can be offloaded. So once we have indicated that we have found a reseller on the website, we are not blocking them immediately to buy tickets, but rather we're offloading that task for later. In red, we trigger another worker. This one sends a request to a Slack channel so that we, the developers, can monitor how many resellers are getting tagged. And this is an example of the Slack notification uh, sidekick worker that we have set up here. So you can see here that we create a JSON string of the username, the skull emoji to indicate reseller, and then the information that I need to know that's gonna get po posted in that sidekick channel. And on the next slide here, you're gonna see an example of that alert. Do note, I'm careful to keep the identification as minimal as possible. Should we wanna further investigate into who this person is within our CRM, we can do a lookup on the provided ID. But you see here, I am not sharing any personal information about that user within our Slack channel. Now, as we may know, the most efficient way to implement low-level caching is to use the Rails cache fetch method. This method does both reading and writing to the cache and has become really important to us as we're doing these reseller checks. Each user is assigned a unique session that they keep when transitioning to the logged in status. We only need to check to see if the user is a reseller every 30 minutes, so we actually cache the result of that check. And this has really helped lend well to the overall performance of the application. So always take a look and evaluate to know how often you need to know the uh, information about a user. So who's there? The more data we have, of course, the better. When considering what user is currently accessing your site, where can you turn to for the most facts? Login data is crucial because it's generally the most accurate of all data and the deepest. It's more permanent than a cookie because users rarely change their login credentials. It's rich because their accounts and attached profiles tend to persist over a longer period of time. And perhaps most important, users carry their login information with them across all different devices. Knowing this, how can you entice all of your users to log in as early as possible? It is unique per company for sure, but for us, we offer exclusive subscriber discounts to logged in users. So I challenge you to try maybe single sign-on or linking anonymous data to known users. Speaking of those anonymous users, anonymous users are still users. Anonymous users are innocent until proven guilty since they can't buy inventory from us without being logged in. 
The future of third-party cookies, the little bits of code that advertisers and websites use to track your web history, has been looking increasingly bleak as privacy concerns continue to escalate. We use cookies at the Trust as a set of secondary set of data. When a known ticket reseller logs into our site, we actually insult, or we insert a small cookie into their web session. When they create a new, brand new customer account, we can automatically tag that account in our CRM as a ticket reseller by detecting that cookie in their browser session. So now that you know that a bad user is on your site, it is time to execute your plan. So what you want to do is really sit down with your team and think about what are the best features of my website? What are the features that my users love? And what are the features that are going to help my users exp expedite the process of enjoying and purchasing the products that we make? What features can we slowly peel away from our quote unquote bad users? For us, it was pretty clear. Three out of four attendees want to pick their own seat at events. We allow them to do just that and also offer the best available seat assignment for any reserved seating event, and we call it Select Your Own Seat, or SYOS. Ticket resellers have data on which seats they can inflate the most, so they eagerly choose these seats during an on-sale with SYOS. Print at home is the most convenient way of receiving your tickets. Not only will you get your tickets right away, but you can print them out anytime before the event. No more waiting for mail delivery or a long will count line. This is perfect for out-of-state ticket resellers. And lastly, we offer the ability to exchange your tickets. This is one of the best benefits of becoming a Pittsburgh Cultural Trust subscriber. If you are unable to attend your scheduled performance, subscribers may exchange their ticket for another performance of the same production. Ticket resellers will buy any ticket package and then will exchange their tickets into better seats that they then often resell. So this is how we execute our plan. So we're gonna take a look at purchasing a performance of Aladdin. So for us, we degrade the experience of buying tickets for these ticket resellers. You can see here, we have a select your own seat feature that users love to use, but we take it away for known ticket resellers. This is what they see when they go to buy that performance. They only see the option for find seats by price. Now, as I mentioned, they love to print at home, so when they go to select their delivery option, it's no longer available. And you can see this happening in real time. Here's a real example of our plan working in action. I was browsing your website to purchase some tickets, but noticed that print at home doesn't seem to be an option anymore, question mark. If I call, am I able to get print at home? Thanks. The answer is no. The result is they did not purchase any tickets during a big pre-sale we were running, and the users that we want to be on our website buying those tickets did. To make sure that you're on the right path and how you model the customer experience, I recommend stepping into their shoes. For us, as I'm building features, I like to know what the experience is, is not only for our ideal patron, but also for that ticket reseller. So I have a feature built into the website so that I can essentially morph into other users. As I complete a feature, I will morph into a ticket reseller's account so I can see their experience. I highly recommend doing this within your own organization. Now your hosting provider can help protect you too. As a certified AWS developer, my team has had the opportunity to use their tools to help our automation process. While there are many hosting providers out there, Amazon still has the largest market share and really is the most feature rich for these kinds of tools. One tool that we have taken advantage of is WAF, which stands for Web Application Firewall. It helps protect your web applications from common web exploits that could affect application availability, compromise security, or consume excessive resources. WAF gives you control over which traffic to allow or block in your web applications by defining customizable web security rules. And those custom rules is where we can add in our behavioral triggers. So remember when we said that we were going to scour the logs looking for bad users taking advantages of us? That is where we can develop rules in order to push those bad users onto different pages of the website or block them altogether. So rules let you precisely target the web requests that you want WAF to allow or block by specifying the exact conditions that you want to watch for. After reviewing our logs recently, we, re we realized that when we refer sites, again, these are the places where the ticket resellers collude with one another privately, 
that would send a lot of resellers to our site. We now use WAF to block those users automatically from accessing our site and make it look like those tickets are sold out. Amazon Guard Duty is a managed threat detection service that continuously monitors for malicious or unauthorized behavior and to help you protect your AWS accounts and workloads. It monitors for activities such as unusual API calls or potentially unauthorized deployments. Again, this is just another tool that is helping you look over your logs for suspicious activity from those bad users. Here's an example of what Guard Duty can find for you. To wrap up this talk, I want you to remember all of the tools that you have available to us. We are so lucky that our, there's just so many tools and features out in the Ruby and Rails community. Fight as hard as you can for your users. Trust me, they will love you for it. Thank you so much for listening to my talk today. You can follow me on Twitter at Britt J. Martin or on GitHub at Wonder Woman 13. I couldn't have done this without the organizers of Ruby on Ice and I will be forever grateful. Now, after the talk today, we have arranged a special live Q&A, so I will be joining you shortly. How was this? Hello, Interesting, right? Virtually. My name is Brittany Martin. Almost there. You're not seeing any of this. Let's, let's hope for it. Just like yesterday, this is not happening. Hope the Wi-Fi holds. Join the meeting. Hello, Brittany. Hi. How is everybody? Meeting. <laughs> oh my God, it's so great to talk to all of you. Thank you so much for listening to my talk. I, I'm directly connected to you, so I'm gonna just like uh, whisper in your ear what the room says. So, to, are there any questions? So, yes, there are. <laughs> getting the mic. Hello, so thank you for your talk. Um, my question is um, about the quietly degrading. I think it's an interesting idea, but I worry, um, like, how do you validate that there's no bugs if there's no obvious... Um, so, because users can't usually notice if there's something wrong, so how can you... Imagine that you flag me uh, accidentally and I will just have a degraded view. So how can I tell that I have a degraded view? Because it's not so, I'm not supposed to tell, but then I will, uh, if I'm affected by a bug, I will never be able to report it back to you. <coughs> Sorry. Did you get the complete question or should I just say it again? Yeah, go ahead and repeat the question for me. I couldn't hear it. <laughs> um, uh, you could come and say it in the document. The question was, uh, how do you um, determine if there are any bugs? But, uh, here's on the conversation. And Oh, sure. Okay, so I'll repeat it maybe faster. So the f um, imagine, that you <laughs> imagine that you flag me accidentally. So how can I tell that you, flag, uh, that you flagged me as accidentally? Because I'm not supposed to be able to tell, but uh, if I can't tell, I can't report you. I will just like have a crappy experience on your website and I will never go back there again. Oh, such a good question. And that definitely happens to us because we um, we offer discounts to large corporations, and what end up ends up happening is that a large group of people in that corporation will all buy tickets at once, which re looks really suspicious to us. And so we actually have reports that we run that looks at the individual accounts that we're flagging as bad users, and we we try to have a little bit of a human interaction to review those as well. But certainly, people do get trapped. And we need a way for them to be able to indicate that up to us, to their customer service, because to your point, you know, we want to assume that users are good until they're proven bad. So we have uh, those behavioral triggers set up, but we do do um, human interaction sometimes just to make sure that they're running correctly. Good question. Thank you. More questions. Thank you. Best thing would be to come directly to the stage. <laughs> Hey, if you haven't had a chance to go on stage yet, like take it. <laughs> <laughs> One more question. <laughs> Hello, Ramon. Hey, Brittany, good to see you. Um, <laughs> thanks again for your talk. Um, to follow up on the last question, I was curious, have you had people come up to you as false negatives and say like, hey, this is not going well for me, what's up with that? Oh, 
Yeah, we have. What they do is they'll, they'll call customer service or they'll submit like a customer service inquiry and they'll be like, hey, I thought this one feature was going to be available or hey, um, I went to go buy tickets to this event and there weren't any seats, like what's going on here? And when that happens, then we will do a, a, like a, an account review. But a lot of times um, they tend to they tend to have fallen down the path of a bad user, but they just don't realize it's being bad. So that's like another another thought as well, is you have good users, you have bad users, and then you have good users who accidentally do bad things. And so you have to treat those in three separate buckets. And sometimes it just takes some education to get those good users to stop doing the bad thing. Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks very much. Ooh, thank you. I appreciate it. No, we are good. Monica. Hello, Brittany. Oh, that was that? super nice. Oh, to I love see your you. shirt. <laughs> Thank you. I know it's, it also says the truth. Um, so, yeah. Okay, so, yeah, just talking to both. Thank you so very much for joining us. It was amazing to have you here. Wonderful. Thank you for having me. Um, I hope to all meet you in person someday. Thank you so much for attending my talk and if you have all of questions i am super available on twitter or email so thank you all have a wonderful conference oh, thank you goodbye Bye.